God bless you. I'm so excited today. Today we're going to be talking about the prophetic mind, the spiritual aspect of the soul man, the spirit man, which is the mind. Now we understand that the brain represents the vehicle that the mind fo functions in, but the brain is not the mind, for the mind reflects the soul. Also, if you are liking this type of content that we're uploading, and maybe you didn't hear about us, or maybe this is your first time popping up on this, hit the like button. And also those that have subscribed, hit the like button. When you hit the like button, it spreads the gospel, the greatest news ever, which is the gospel, so other people can be taught and can be touched. But also, it allows the rhythm or the algorithm of YouTube to be able to spread this type of content. Hey fam, you're probably wondering why the content stopped. Well, I want you to hit the like button and I want you to hit the subscribe button and also share to a friend that you think might be touched or inspired by this content. I'm not leaving until you hit it. You still didn't hit it. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the content. Budapest Symphony Orchestra proudly presents the voice of the new generation. Manasseh Jordan in the highly anticipated short film Until Then. Until then my eyes behold that city. Until the day my Jesus called. Coming soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody else is when you go to the bank this time, <sighs> approval. The thing is spirit of living God. My God. God says that he's singling you out because God says there's an anointing on your life. And God says you tell Omen Joseph that I'm calling him for ministry. It's Jonathan's time for a miracle. Who's Jonathan? My name's Jonathan. Jeez, my God. Stay connected to Prophet Manasseh Jordan. Text the words text MJ to 33339. That's T E X T M J to 33339. In today's program, it's going to be very thought provoking. The Bible begins to declare in Romans chapter 7, verse 25, For it is with the mind that we serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. It is very important that we understand that it is the mind that brings service while the body is the sacrifice. Have you not offered up your body as a living sacrifice? And so today, in this intriguing, thought-provoking teaching, we delve deep into the enigmatic nature of the human mind, exploring the intricate and complex subject matters deeply rooted in the principles and governances. Join us as we journey through the working of the world bound by the fundamental attitude, convictions, and beliefs that originate within the mind itself. From faith to self-referential loops, we uncover the secrets of the human cognitive faculties and the power they willed. Follow us as we challenge individuals to scrutinize the very source that guides their thoughts and actions, urging them to transform their mind and break free from the pattern of this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind. The Bible declares that. And today you're going to discover the commanding power of the mind, which is known and which we speak and call the supreme commander of the human body. And its influence is over the microcosmic empire within each individual. <laughs> God, today is going to be so good. Through engaging this discussion, experts, analysts, and thought-provoking insights, Mind Mastery provides an essential guide to understanding the nature of the mind and its workings. 
Unlocking the key to human governances and control. Tune in to today's special on the prophetic mind mastery and the master your mind today. The nature of the human mind is an intricate and complex subject matter, deeply rooted in the principles of governances, both collective and individual. The creation of the world itself was fashioned through the omnipotent of faith, as the book of Hebrews proclaim. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Hebrews 11 verse 3. The workings of the world, therefore, are bound by the fundamental attitudes, convictions, and beliefs that originate in the mind. Individuals being governed by their own cognitive faculties rarely scrutinize the very source that guides their thoughts and actions. The mind itself is the only instrument available for such introspection, resulting in a self-referential loop. Invariably, the mind prevails in these mental arguments and polemics, guided by its own inclinations and desires. These conundrum is precisely why the sacred scripture admonishes us not to conform to the pattern of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of our mind. Romans 12 verse 2. Indeed, as the supreme commander of the human body, the mind, exercises control over the microcosmic empire within each individual. Which is the body? This miniature empire, the human being, is directed and influenced by the commanding power of the mind. Therefore, to comprehend the nature of the mind and its workings is to understand the essential elements of human governance and control. We're about to delve deeper in understanding the human being's empire, which encompasses all forms of life within the broader world. We must understand that the you in verse, which is the you expressed in reverse, is really only a reflection of the inner part of you which is known as the microcosm of the macrocosm. The universe symbolizes the inverse of you, reflecting your own nature and your own aspects of yourself. We see this in the broader world, constituting a complete world thriving on three distinct planes. These planes are known as the body, the mind, and the spirit. And this is known as the temple when they built this in the Bible, which was seen as the outer court, the inner court, and the holies of holies. The holies of holies represent the spirit, whereas the inner court represents the soul or mind, manas, where the body represents the outer court. The body is often regarded as a blue colored structure. I want you to really understand what I'm saying. Tasked and to be obedient to obsiliquates to what the mind is saying with menial labor and enduring the domination of the higher faculties, which is the mind. Despite these inclinations not always being in the best interests, the body's purpose and goals are directed by the mind and emotions. The body remains unconscious, only doing and believing whatever the mind says, which act as the greater executive faction. While the body lacks executive power, 
it is not without significance. As without the mind and emotions, it would be inert and useless, lacking purpose and direction. So what is the body? How does the body function? And how is it to be a slave, a servant to the mind? Could this be why the Bible says to offer your body as a holy sacrifice? What does that mean? Let's go a little further. The empire of the human being comprises every form of life present within the larger panorama of the world that surrounds us. This microcosmic realm is home to continents and races, as well as arts and sciences, transportation systems, and educational theories, constituting a complete world that exists and thrives on three distinct planes. These planes are readily apparent and more often than not are utilized in a manner that is less than ideal. As demonstrated in the temple described in the Bible, these levels are represented by the outer court, the inner court, and holy of holies, signifying the body, mind, and spirit, respectively. The physical body, which is the final basis of the human persona, is often regarded as a kind of blue-collared structure, taxed with performing menial labor as suggested in Genesis 3.19, which speaks of the body becoming a servant to the mind. The body must carry out directives of the mind and emotions, even through these inclinations may not be in its best interests. It must endure the domination of the higher faculty of the mind, which are often dishonorable and do what is expected of it. If commanded to remain upright, the body complies until succumbed, lacking any resource or recourse beyond itself. The body must accept the final enslavement imposed upon it by the mind and emotion. However, if the mind and emotions were absent, the body would like be inert and useless. The body on its own would be merely a creature striving to find sustenance and survival, lacking any particular purpose or goal. The body is not an executive instrument, but rather a victim of the greater executive faction residing above it, being the mind. In this situation, the body is typically disregarded and given little attention. Now we're about to delve deeper into the dynamics of the human entity, the persona, the personality that has created your personal reality. It becomes clear that the physical vessels of the human being is subject to the absolute rule or rulership of the cognitive faculties and affective states of the mind. Devoid of any inherent liberties, analogous to the collective body of labor within society. You can see the same comparison as it is represented in the macrocosm of the world in the microcosm. Nevertheless, the body is bestowed to or with a unique privilege that allows it to go on strike or boycott should it endure or be stretched beyond its limits. Such manifestations of dissatisfaction are typically accompanied by a degree of discomfort, and this really is the representation of pain, and may result in severe consequences that can be maniacal or even deadly. 
Despite this, it is our responsibility of the mind, the superior element of the human, to composite, to revere the body as a temple. This is what the Bible begins to teach the believer. How to be able to facilitate the first relationship that one needs to learn. And that relationship is between the mind and the body. And when the relationship between the mind and the body begins to suffer, the relationship between others suffer, and the relationship between God also suffers. Recognizing its obligation and duties while conferring upon its specific advantages, indeed the corporeal structure, which is the body, of the human being is known as the common wealth. Now I go deeper in my School of Prophets where I discuss the body being or known as the common wealth, capable of generating motivation and imparting tyranny of both effective and cognitive forces, and any form of destructive emotions such as hate, greed, can cause physical harm to the body. The notion that a robust physique can coexist with perverted emotions is but a fallacy. Our attitudes, even within the scripture, are frequently misguided, and this is why there is so much emphasis of or for the fruit of the Spirit. We see the Bible going into detail. Blessed are they that are pure in heart. Blessed are they that are long-suffering. Blessed are they. These are attitudes that one must be able to have and one must imply onto the servant, which is the body. Frequently misguided, rooted in self-interest, the mind, rather than moral restitude, will begin to cause the body to suffer. We must acknowledge the body's importance. The body is in seed form and what has to begin to be transformed in his image. And we see this through the communion. We taking the Lord's body and putting it in our body to transform our body so that it can represent or be raised through the resurrection body. If the same spirit that dwelled in Christ shall quicken your mortal body or mortality from the body. The Holy Scripture urges us in this way. I love the word of God. Glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 and to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Romans 12, verse 1. So your body is not your own. It belongs to the Master. The corporeal frame of the human being is subjugated to the autocracy of the mind and emotions, devoid of any inherent rights comparable to the collective body of labor in society. However, the body does possess the singular right to strike or boycott and may exercise this right when its tolerance has been exceeded. Such demonstrations of displeasure are accompanied by discomfort and may result in dire consequences. Nevertheless, it is the duty of the superior element of the human entity being the mind to respect the body as a temple, recognizing its obligation and duties while conferring upon its distinct benefit. The physical structure of the human being is indeed a common wealth, comparable of motivation and conferring happiness upon the individual. 
Despite this, the body remains susceptible to the despotism of both emotion and thought, and all manners of destructive emotions such as hate can inflict physical harm upon it. The notion that a robust physical form can coexist with perverted emotions is a fallacy. Our attitudes are often misguided as they are grounded in self-interest rather than what is right and just. In recognition of the importance of the body, the Holy Bible counsels us to glorify God in your body, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, and to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, Romans 12 verse 1. Now, we spoke about the body being known as the common wealth. But now let's talk about how the adverse effects of emotional stress. This is even seen hormonally. This is known as the stress hormone. And the effects of this on the physical body has been extensively studied particularly in the realm of psychoanalysis. Despite emotions being a fundamental aspect of the human experience, if left unchecked, they can deplete and impair the physical body. In the story where you see Jesus saying, because of your little faith, He's referring to the emotional state that one sits in on why they are unable to be a partaker of the kingdom or to speak to the mountain. Desire is one of the most salient emotions, emotional functions, and it demands frequently supersedes the body's well-being, resulting in the various conditions such as alcoholism, addiction, anxiety, and even different forms of post-traumatic stress disorders. The mind motivated by the pursuit of confidence or even amusement often endorses these provocative actions. And when this displays itself, disregarding their harmful impact on the temple, which is the body. Now we're talking about this because this next aspect or part, we're going to go deeper because we see that in Western culture or in medicine, they're so concerned with the body, but less concerned with the mind that has injured the body. If emotions and the mind become overly authoritarian, a demigod, an autocracy, they may lead to delirium tremens, which can prove fatal, as stated in Proverbs 23, verse 20. Do not be with those who drink too much wine or with those who gorge themselves on meat. For the drunkards and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe them with rags. Therefore, it is an imperative nature for an individual to exert self-control. This is seen in the fruit of the Spirit as temperance and restrain 
in their emotional and mental lives to prevent the negative consequences that can ensue from ignoring or ignorance to the physical body's requirements. Let's go deeper in understanding the relationship between the emotional states of the mind and the effects on the unconscious aspect, which is the body. The deleterious effect of emotional pressure on the physical body are well established and have been the subject of much scientific inquiry, particularly in the field of psychoanalysis. As seen in the Holy Scriptures, emotions are a fundamental aspect of human nature, yet they can prove to be depleting and debilitating to the physical body if they are allowed to run amok. One of the most prominent emotional functions is desire, and the demands of the emotion often takes precedence over the well-being of the body, leading to a variety of elements such as alcoholism, addiction, anxiety, and forms of post-traumatic stress disorders. The mind, which employs these behaviors for the sake of confidence or juviality, often condones these provocative actions. Despite the negative impact they have on the body, ultimately, if the emotions and the mind become too despotic, the individual may succumb to delirium tremens, which can lead to an early grave as is recounted in Proverbs 23, verse 20 to 21. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor. Drowsiness clothes them in rags. Therefore, it is crucial for individuals to exercise self-control and discipline in their emotional mental lives in order to avoid the destructive consequences that can arise from negligence or neglecting the needs of the physical body. Now, we delved deep into the effects of the states and the emotional states that it has on the body. But I would like to even go deeper because the corporeal vessel is often overlooked and disregarded by the fickle and capricious mind, you heard me, of humanity. Despite its paramount importance in maintaining optimum health and function, nevertheless, we see a different type of approach that I go deep into in my school of the prophets that the older prophets taught me. One of this is seen in the Eastern style where they develop a unique approach to health care, prioritizing preventative care and emphasizing the responsibility of an individual to live in accordance with the principles of their culture. Now for us believers, these principles are hidden in the Word of God. And these are what is known or what the older prophets would teach us, the life principles. These principles are not seen in the gifts of the Spirit, but they're rather seen in the fruit of the Spirit. And if one obeys them, they're able to experience life eternity. Now, I cannot stretch this, stress this more 
So I want you to really listen to me. Your salvation or freedom or liberation does not come from the gifts of the Spirit. Those are manifestations. But it comes through the fruit of the Spirit, which all different aspects of the nine different leaves, the older prophets would say the fruit is one fruit, but there's different petals of the leaf. It is a nine leaf petal. Each of those leaves represent your ability and relationship between the mind and the body and how it expresses itself in your relationships with others. When we go deeper into this, especially in the Eastern culture of how they did medicine, they would not be paid for someone that is sick. In the Western culture, the healthcare system makes money off of your sickness. But in the Eastern culture and by the people that were the mystics, they understood that they should only be compensated for your wellness. These physicians, which were really prophetic or prophets, possessed the knowledge of the Holy Word of understanding the fruit of the Spirit, which teaches us how to live. This included aspects of prophetic acupuncture and specialized knowledge in what would be known or what would be called as herbology. And this is why we are building a $22 million center for the School of the Prophets where we will be doing trainings as well as having specialists that will be teaching this in a full garden. Once we begin to understand how to cultivate this type of awareness of this responsibility and maintaining one's own health through the proper relationship between the mind and the body, then we are able to understand the true meaning of the relationship between the Christos. Now, the biblical passage that we begin to see this is in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, verse 22, which reinforces the importance of attending to the teachings of the wise as they provide the keys to life as well as health. Let us go further into this because there is more. The desires and whims of the human mind seldom take into account the well-being and optimal function of the physical body. And it must be notated that one that lives their life through their own desires is equivalent to one that is eating from the tree of knowledge. However, it is important to recognize that the body is a neglected factor that cannot be easily kept in good health. As even the most skilled physicians struggle to do so. In contrast, the Eastern approach, such as in the Chinese medicine in their healthcare system, where they hire doctors when they are healthy and do not pay them if they get sick, this incentives with the doctor is to prioritize preventative care and to teach the individuals the law of living in accordance with the Chinese culture. The medical practitioner, typically a Taoist philosopher, possesses knowledge of the esoteric and mystical healing practices such as acupuncture and specialized pharmaceuticals with herbs. The doctor expects the individual to enlighten and aware of the responsibilities of the superior person, which is the mind. It is the superior person who has the right to be healthy. 
and an individual who does not adhere to the rules of life has no right to a healthy body or a happy relationship with it. This is the first relationship that must be cultivated in all of humanity. The relationship between the body and the mind. The individual who acts on their own desires and disregard the rules physically subject their body to a mental and emotional pressure, ultimately shortening their lifespan and depresses their own actions and cultures. As the book of Proverbs 4 verse 20 begins to declare, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ears unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. As we're delving deeper into this, we are starting to understand that the spirit man, which is the soul or known in modern terms as the human mind, is complex and potent tool and an important tool capable of affecting every aspect of our lives. However, without proper training, and guidance, it can lead to a negative, malevolent consequences for our emotions and physical health. As stated in Proverbs 4 verse 23, we must guard our heart and mind with vigor and diligence as they dictate the course of our lives. When our minds are properly governed in the Word of God, so important, so, 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 so important, a mind that stays on Him. They work in harmony with our emotions and protect the temple, which is our body, leading to stability and well-being. And in my school, the prophets, I go further in speaking about the spiritual alchemy that also begins to take place. However, when this balance is disrupted, negative consequences arise. And this can also be seen, as long as the earth remaineth, there shall always be seed time and harvest. Now, the earth is the macrocosm, but the microcosm of the earth is the human body. The earth possessing 80% water, the human body possessing 80% water. The earth being mostly made out of the gas carbon, oxygen, and even different parts of nitrogen, the human body also being mostly of these types of forms. The phenomenon can be observed in modern society as well, where certain activities have a tendency to deplete or depress emotions. Personal actions have consequences both for ourselves and for the world at large. Now, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it warns us that we will reap what we sow. Therefore, we must take responsibility for our mental and emotional states and attitudes in order to maintain harmony within ourselves and the world around us. But before we can have harmony in the world around us, we first have to possess the inner peace, creating the harmony between the mind and the body. Philippians 4 verse 8 
one of my grandmother's favorite scriptures. It instructs us how to do this and it teaches us what to focus on. Positive and virtuous thoughts in order to better govern ourself and contribute to the well-being of the world. But there is more. Pull in a little closer and find out how. The human mind is a powerful and mysterious instrument capable of influencing one's life in a profound way. However, this instrument is often not properly trained, leading to a negative consequence for the body and emotions. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In other words, it is the importance to guard one's thought and emotions as they ultimately determine the course of one's life. When the mind is properly trained and governed, it can work in harmony with the emotions and protect the body, resulting in a stability and well-being. However, when the mind loses its integration or fails to maintain its proper relation with life, the other two factors suffer. This can be seen in modern society, where many sports and activities have a tendency to deplete or depress emotions. It is crucial to understand that personal mistakes and actions have consequences. These perfunctories, both for oneself and for the world at large. The Bible warns us in Galatians 6 verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, so shall they reap. Thus, it is our responsibility to cooperate mentally to preserve the harmony of our own being and the world around us. In the Eastern culture, the doctor is not merely a practitioner of medicine, but also holds the philosophy that teaches the individuals the law of living. Similarly, we must educate ourselves on the proper governance of the mind in order to live a healthy and fulfilling life. As the Bible states in Philippians 4 verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever thing are true, whatsoever thing are honest, Whatsoever thing are just, whatsoever thing are pure, whatsoever thing are lovely, whatsoever thing are of good report. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. By focusing our minds on positive and virtuous thoughts. We can better govern ourselves and contribute to the well-being of the world. Now we delved into the other aspects of the fundamentals of the mind, but we must understand that there is devastating consequences for our selfishness, cupidity, rapaciousness, and arrogance, which have become pervasive, scourging upon our planet, corroding our social fabric and devastating our environment. These destructive attitudes are not simply the result of the misguided policies but are deeply entrenched within the psyche of the individual. In order to counter this, we must engage in introspection. This is known in the Holy Bible as
prayer and cultivate the necessary and what is necessary to value our the value of benevolence organizer and executivity of the mind unfortunately and this is why those that are partners and that support the work that we are doing we must place an importance on this that why we want to build the center the first center for the school of the prophets where believers all around the world can be educated we have to create a current educational model that teaches us because right now in modern society especially in the western culture the models fail to instill these values leading to perpetuating of suffering to become a true superior person that has mastered the mind where the mind does not master you we must diagnose our flaws reject the patterns of selfishness and renew our minds with the values of benevolence and the greater good and this can only be done through yielding to the holy spirit but what is the issue why is this so difficult and how has culture played a role in this issue the insidious emotions of selfishness cupidity and arrogance are the scourge of our planet undermining it at every turn the policies that are contributing to the destruction of our ecosystem are entrenched in the minds of those who engage in these pernicious habits although it may be difficult to accept the root of our societal and environmental decay is not found by scaling the fiery cliffs of mount sinai instead it can be unearthed by introspection reflecting on the attitudes that dominate our personal lives the superior person which is the mind one who lives in accordance with their own highest ideals need not be a genius but must possess the core values of civility in humanity however the mind which is hard to subdue and perpetually at odds with order is preoccupied with the ambition and rarely dedicates time to self-improvement therefore in order to instill the necessary fundamentals of a benevolent organizer and executive we must start with education at a young age and remain steadfast in nurturing it in my school of the prophets we teach this and have a full course in educating the believer current educational models fail to achieve this objective instead encouraging sneaky and rule breaking behaviors that ultimately perpetuate human suffering to prevent this the mind must be taught that benevolence is the most critical attribute of a successful ruler integrity be it of a country or a human body a good ruler ensures the flourishing of their people while a bad ruler causes suffering and may lead to a revolution to become a superior person mentally we must first diagnose the requirements of such a person 
Most individuals believe themselves to be superior and are unwilling to accept their flaws. Pride, pertination, and the desire for success drives this tendency. However, success achieved through rule-breaking sets a dangerous precedent, leading to the eventual breaking of those very rules of life. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12 verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We must reject fully, repulsively, the patterns of selfishness, cupidity, rapaciousness, and arrogance that have led to our current predicament and instead renew our mind with the values of benevolence, integrity, and the greater good. Now, when we understand what the issue is and we diagnose this, now we can fix the mind, mastering it. One of the first things that the older prophets would teach us is how to overcome the aspect of the mind known as chitta. The way how we use it in our Christian tradition deals with the monkey aspect of the mind, proliferating through thoughts and ideas, going back and forth, and really thinking the same things over and over and over again. Science has shown that 90% of our thoughts are repetitive thoughts that we thought yesterday. And in the prophetic tradition, as well as certain Eastern cultures, they teach that one must cultivate integrity in the mind, which is the first step in teaching a child to become or master the mental faculty. The superior person or master of the mind reframes from destructive or selfish acts. Instead, choosing to prioritize the greater good and to treat others as they wish to be treated, reflecting on how they treat the temple, which is the body. Honesty, fairness, and a dedication to purpose and destiny are essential traits for achieving this form of mastery. However, in modern society, it has had a great shift and a focus towards accumulating wealth and power. Where the Word of God teaches us is not by power, nor by might, but by the Spirit. In the modern culture, the accumulating of wealth and power are at the expenses of others, leading to fear, truculent activity dishonor, mendacity, and compromised principles. To counteract this trend, education is essential. I must begin in cultivating and fully developing the fruit of the Spirit. And selfless mind dedicated to doing the good work, which is the gospel. Let us delve further in understanding how this cultivation is a necessity for mastering the aspect of the cheetah or monkey 
aspect of the mind. In the Eastern culture, speaking such as the Chinese, the initial step in teaching a child is to instill the integrity necessary for the development of a purposeful and superior individual mind. The superior person is one who refrains from committing inferior deeds that are destructive, selfish, or damaging to the public or private good. This reflects in how they treat the body. A superior person must be a builder, not a destroyer, putting others before oneself. Recognizing the genius and serving integrity where it exists and keeping the rules of the Confucian Code, which advocates the golden rule, which is in the word of God, treating others as one would wish to be treated. In the word of God, it says, how can you love me if you do not love your own neighbor? Am I my brother's keeper? The first step of education is to teach an individual the value of honesty. It is worthiness and the reasons for its acquisitions as honesty is the fundamental form for happiness. However, one may find oneself surrounded by people who do not share these values, leading one to compromise the principle and follow the leaders of the day rather than being a good Christian. To achieve superiority, which is the walk of the believer, one must cultivate a mind that is fully developed, integrated in honesty, fear, humane, and not self-centered to the point of enduring others suffering to advance one's own cause. Such a mind must be dedicated to the purpose and serve as a vigilant and caring guardian of the emotional levels of the human body and soul and the larger emotional and physical body of humanity. These principles constitute a code that is meant to guide one towards living well, doing good, and being happy. This code is seen in the Holy Bible as the fruit of the Spirit, and it is our ability to germinate this is what gives us true salvation. However, something has gone wrong in our society, leading to fear, selfishness, dishonor, bigotry, and a single-minded focus on getting ahead by cheating others if necessary. Our idea of a Christian has become someone who has accumulated wealth or power, which is difficult to achieve without compromising one's principle. Thus, the child in school must begin with cultivating of its mind. This is the first key to the prophetic sacred tradition, and I'm sharing this because it is also the key to being the prophet. As the mind is the key to living a purposeful and Christian life.